I heard the uh, collective, oh, and I get that. I get that. You're, you're used to T-bone steak all the time, but a cold bologna sandwich ain't going to hurt you every once in a while. Man. I, was, uh, I didn't ask for an amen on that, brother. <laughs> I was telling Brother Lawson, I, I was down in uh, Cleveland. Uh, I don't lose track of time. You, you get my age. You'll, you'll say something about to something you done uh, the other day, and you get to thinking, the channel say, honey, that was three years ago. Oh, well, okay. Uh, if you're not there yet, just, just sell on. You'll, you'll be there. Yeah. But uh, this hasn't been long ago at all, and I was telling uh, Preacher Lawson, uh, there's preachers there from uh, Kentucky, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, a bunch from Tennessee, and uh, when they introduced me, they mentioned that I was from Maynardville. And I was shocked to find out that people in Alabama and Georgia never heard of Maynardville. <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, we, we've got uh, two red lights there now. And uh, one of them said, uh, how close are you to Knoxville? And I said, I'm, I'm about 15 miles north of Knoxville. And he said, I pulled an old Ed Ballou on him, preacher. He said, uh, so you're not that far from Knoxville? And I said, no, not at all. He said, you know Charles Lawson? I said, I don't know. Do you like him? <laughs> I learned. I learned my lesson. Yeah, I learned because I had this fellow to come up before I preached, and he didn't know me from Adam, didn't know where I come from. And he said, uh, you know, you just let people talk long enough, and their ignorance just, bust, just comes out all over them. And he said, uh, you ever listen to any of them radio preachers? And I said, well, yeah, a few here and there. You ever listen to that idiot over in Fountain City? And I'm getting ready to get him to preach. And I said, well, which one? There's a bunch of them. He said that when he gets on the radio and talks about the mark of the beast and this 666 and the white horse and all that stuff going on about it. I said, oh, him, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, he's a nut, ain't he? I said, I mean, that guy, he's off in left field somewhere. He said, you know who I'm talking about? And I said, yeah, that's my pastor. <laughs> you remember me telling him, I mean, I mean, I nailed his hide to the wall right there. And then he had to sit there and listen to me preach. So when you know when this feller from Alabama uh, said, uh, uh, "Do you know Charles Lawson?" and I said, "Well, do you like him?" and he told me to inform the preacher that there's a lot of crimson tide. They don't care much for the orange, but they love this preacher. And I'm telling you, I had it's just it blessed my heart. I had people from Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina when they found out Maynardville. Where's that at? Well, that's close to. Are you close to Temple? Do you know Charles? And and so. This church has an outreach that you can't even imagine. You can't even imagine. And you imagine what a target that he is for the devil. He's not just feeding temple. He's, he's the under shepherd of Temple Baptist Church. But when that word goes out, he's feeding untold thousands, probably millions of people. And, uh, man, I'm telling you, I just... Uh, what a privilege. What, what a privilege. Now, open your Bible tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And I'm going to begin reading at verse number 7 down through verse number 18. And while you're turning, uh, Brother Sam, he, now I've never preached this message before, but you heard me preach a message at a different church quite a while back. And uh, there, there's one point here that's going to intersect with that one. Okay, but this one's brand new. Okay, this one's fresh out of the oven. <laughs> All righty, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, and uh, we'll begin in reading with verse number 7. Paul says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, that's the treasure, and not of us, that's the vessel. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body. The, now, what I'm reading, it's like, it's, like, it's like a preacher walking through a thicket full of rabbits. 
Now, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. And, I, and I'm telling you, it's so hard for me not to jump a rabbit and take off after it and get away from what the Lord's laid on my heart to preach. Yeah. So I'm going to try my best not to jump a rabbit through this and stay with exactly what the Lord laid on my heart tonight. Because it's, it's just packed full. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore I have spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak. Yes. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant mercy might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, and pay close attention to verse number 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. Yeah. Verse 18, and if we could just get this, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. My Father, yeah. as I bow in your presence, Lord, I've done the praying, the preparation, I've sought your face, but my Father, unless you hide me behind the cross tonight, and unless you anoint me, I'll bore these precious folks to tears. I pray, Lord, you'd take these lips of clay, and I pray you'd use them, Lord, to bless and praise and uplift the holy, blessed, sweet name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for preaching this message to me. I needed it so in such a tremendous way. Now, I pray you'd help me, Lord, to paint the picture that you painted me. Now, I'm not the artist that you are, but God, I pray tonight that you'd get me out of the way and hide me and you'd take full control. I ask it in Jesus' name for his sweet sake, I pray. My, 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 there's a reason for this message tonight. And this is the part, Brother Sam, that kind of went along with a message I preached a long time ago. But there, there's a reason for this. I got a phone call sometime, it's been a long time ago, okay, from a preacher's wife that I knew very well. And she said, talking about her husband, she said he's, he's on his bed, he won't eat, he won't get up. Now this is a great man of God I'm talking about. A man that knew far more scripture than I did, been preaching far more many years than I had, pastored many more years than I had, but she felt like maybe I could do something to help him. Said he's in a state of deep, deep, deep depression. And he feels totally forsaken of God. Said, could you just come over and have prayer with him? And I thought, I remember driving over there, I thought, man, I mean, what can I tell this brother that he don't already know? Well, I mean, he, he's done forgotten more scripture than I'll ever learn. But I went in and, and uh, uh, I just honored to be in his presence. But I looked at a man that was going through a time of deep, deep, dark depression. And I remember pastoring and people coming up to me and saying, Preacher, pray for me. I'm dealing with some depression. And I can remember saying, yeah, all right, sure, I'll pray for you. And then they'd walk off and i think, yeah, life's hard, man. You know, just get a grip. Until you take your little stroll through that valley. Amen. Then you tend to have a lot more compassion when somebody tells you that they're going through that dark, dark yes, valley. And he told me this. He said, preacher, I'm a man totally forsaken of God. I won't call his name because there's probably people in this building that's heard this man preach. He's a great man of God. And he said, I'm, 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 God don't even hear me anymore when I pray. He's just totally shut me out. He said, I'm totally forsaken of God. And said, I give up. I cannot get a hold of him. He wants nothing to do with me. Now, there's no scripture that I could have given him that he didn't already know. 
There's nothing I could say to him that he didn't already know. And so all I could do was have prayer with him Amen. and just leave. Yeah. And man, I remember driving home. My heart was crushed. My heart was crushed. I felt like I'd failed the Lord, but I didn't know anything else to say to him because he was such a soldier of the faith, one of my heroes. And I thought, my, I, that night I didn't understand that. I thought, how in the world could a man that knows that much Bible and has walked as long as he's walked with the Lord, how could a man like that get to the point where they feel like they're totally forsaken of God and, 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 and God don't even know they exist? And then uh, as time went on and, and uh, clicked on and I got older, pastored longer, I realized exactly what he was talking about. I went through those thoughts of feeling like, okay, God, you've put me on a shelf. You've forsaken me. I, the Lord showed me something that helped me, and I, I, I pray tonight that it'll help you. The same Paul, the same Paul that just wrote what we read, he wrote Romans eight twenty eight. 28. We all like to quote. We all love to quote that. Man, I've quoted that many times to people in the hospital. And we know that all things work together for the good. To those that love God, to those that are the called according to his purpose. Man, that's hallelujah ground right there. Paul wrote that. Paul also wrote, I believe, Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 5 where he said the Lord said he would never leave us and he'd never forsake us. Man, we like, I mean, I, you know, we, we can, ah, boy, I love that. But we tend to forget that the same Paul also wrote 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. And in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, Paul makes these statements that he was beaten with rods. 39 stripes he took five times of the Romans. Beaten with rods three times. My goodness, stoned and left for dead outside the gate of Lystra. He mentions nine, eight perils that he's gone through. He mentions being hungry, being thirsty, being cold, and having a thorn in the flesh. Now, wait a minute. Ah, wait a minute. Ah, how do we reconcile these verses that come from the same writer? And once, in one part, he says he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And then in 2 Th uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 11, he said, man, I was hung out to dry. He never mentions that he was forsaken. As a matter of fact, look how he handles it. Look how he handles it back in 2 Corinthians 4. Look at it in verse number 8. He's talking about having a treasure in an earthen vessel. He's talking about the outer man and the inward man. The outward man wants nothing to do with God. The outward man is the enemy of God. The outward man is your enemy. The outward man is my enemy. My flesh is not saved and neither is yours. We're still waiting for the redemption of the body to wit. And when we get it, it's not going to be a makeover. <laughs> no, it's a brand spanking new one. But if you're saved tonight and born again, there is a battle that rages inside you. As I heard an old Indian preacher, and it wasn't Brother Baloo, it was a different one. But he said, there's two dogs living inside you if you're saved. There's a good dog and a bad dog. And the one that is, that's the strongest is the one you feed the most. Oh. Oh. So Paul says, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. That's what Paul said. But he also said, I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full. You won't ever hear Oldstein preach that. And to be hungry. He wrote to Timothy and he said, bring my coat. And I hope you can get here before the winter. Why? Paul was freezing to death. Was he God's man? Did he know what he was writing when he said he'd never leave you nor forsake you? Of course he did. But if you look at Paul's life, would you not look at him and think, oh my goodness, you mean, you mean to tell me that's, that's the apostle Paul? Shivering in this prison, in this dungeon? 
with his feet in that filth? That's the apostle Paul that says he can do all things through Christ that strengthens him? He looks like a man forsaken of God as far as I'm concerned. Wouldn't you agree? Would you not agree? We have to reconcile the differences between the eternal and the temporal. Between the outer man and the inward man. Now let me tell you something. The Lord is not going to come down and stop life just for you because you're saved. Life is going to happen. It's going to happen. He's not going to save our flesh out of life. He's not going to do that. As a matter of fact, he warns us as long as we're in this flesh that temptation's going to come. He talks about all of the, he he talks about uh, the strife that's in the world. You're going to experience that. The same things that are accomplished in your brethren are going to be accomplished in you. You're not exempt. But let me show you something. He never promised, find it, show it to me. He never made one promise in here to my flesh that he wouldn't forsake it. Amen, preacher. He said that he felt my infirmities and he prayed for me. Does he care when you're sick? Sure he does. Sure he does. But the outward man is the enemy of God. The Bible said the carnal mind can't even comprehend the things of God. Cannot observe the law of God. Not subjected to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. Because it's carnal. Your flesh will never rise above anything that it is right now. But it's temporal. When Paul talks about, I'll never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. He's talking about that treasure That's inside the earthen vessel. Oh, man. Man, you was talking about having a dream and all this stuff. And I thought, I eat pizza late at night. I have all kinds of weird dreams, man. But I was in bed the other night, and this is honest to goodness truth. The Lord started speaking to me about something my dad would do many years ago when I worked for him. My daddy was, man, he was something else. He he told me he joined the army because he was hungry. He's starving to death, so he joined the army so he could eat. But my daddy was a plumber. And dad always took care of his tools. And, and, and every time you'd use a sawzall, right angle drill, you wiped that thing down, man. It didn't matter how, you wiped it down. If it had sawdust on it, you blew the sawdust off. And you always put it back in the box that it came in. Now, he didn't, t- he didn't worry about the box. And I'm laying in bed and I remembered, man, I'll be 70 soon. Isn't it crazy how your mind works? I can remember things that happened 50 years ago and I can't tell you what I done yesterday. Just sell on, you'll get there. And I'm laying in the bed trying to sleep and I remember one day, dad had a, another helper that was a plumber. You know, I, I, was, uh, I was just a grunt. He was trying to teach me the trade. And, and his buddy Bill would say, hey, go to the truck and get this. Hey, boy, turn your hat around backwards so it looked like you already had it back. I mean, they just, just worked me like a borrowed mine mule, man. But I'd go out there and get that, I'd get that dad's right angle drill. Man, I'm telling you, that box, the handle was broke. One of the latches was broke. And I, I hated going out and getting it because you couldn't just get it. I'd have to carry it like this. You know, because it's going to pop open. That right angle drill's going to fall out. And then bad things happen if you mess with dad's tools. And I remember, isn't this something, brother? I remember like it was just yesterday. I set that thing down and I said, I'm tired of carrying that stupid thing, man. I'm sick and tired of it. When you put one of dad's tools up, you put the tool right back in the box that came in and you took the power cord and you folded it, not like you used to put my tools up, Sean. You folded it just right, and you put it back in its approved place so there wasn't no kinks in it. And I remember complaining. I said, why don't you get a box for that right-angle drill? The drill looks new, but that box. He said, I'm not worried about the box. The money's on the inside. 
Huh? Woo! You ever had a shouting spell about 4 a.m. in the morning? Hey, it's not about the earthen vessel. No! It's not about this old box. It's about the treasure on the inside. That's what the earnest money, the spirit was paid for, not the outward box. We've got to separate between the outward man that's temporal and the inward man that's eternal. My, there's some promises in this Bible made to the outward man, and you, you won't like them, but you'll find them in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. You say, give me a promise, preacher. You want one for the outward man? Yeah, hit me with it. Well, Ecclesiastes chapter number 12 says that the foundation is going to give way. That's what it says. It says the grinders. You know what that means. The grinders are going to cease and fall out. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. You mean this body that I pamper and, and, and just uh, do so much for, it's going to fall apart. It's going to do exactly what it was designed to do. The grinders are going to cease. You're going to get to where you can't see out of the windows. The eyes are going to be gone. Yeah. yeah. Man, what a... And you're headed for a hole in the ground. Huh. Man, won't you tell me something? Man, preacher, them guys I listen to on the TV, they don't, they don't go there. No, because you won't pay to hear the truth. Yeah. But there is a promise. Hallelujah. There's a promise to the inward man. That part that he saved, redeemed, and placed inside of you, let me assure you. Let me make you a solemn promise. Hey, the box may get busted. It may get dented. It may get eat up with rust. But the money's on the inside. Hallelujah. What he died on the cross for is the treasure that's inside that earth and, and he'll never forsake it. You know why? Because he can't forsake himself. <laughs> There's part of him right in here. Man, he can't forsake. Does my flesh feel forsaken sometimes? Oh, are you kidding me? And if you say you've never felt that way, you're a liar. That's just a, 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 hey, you can't live in this life and not get to a point sometimes where you just feel like, oh, well, okay. You know, you know what I've done for you. Remind the Lord how good you are and all that you've done. And you say, now you've just forsaken me. It's not about the flesh. He didn't promise anything to your flesh. Your flesh is his enemy. That's truth. And I'll tell you something I've learned down through the years. The closer the outward man gets to death, the louder the inward man speaks. Yeah. Ah, man, I've been in too many hospital rooms and watched too many saints of God getting ready to cross over. Be there one day and they can't even talk. Walked in Miss Wright's room. Oh, bless her little memory. Walked in there the day before and she couldn't even raise up in the bed. Couldn't even speak a word. Man, and the nurses said, she's not going to make it long. She probably won't make it overnight. Well, she did. And I went back the next day. And she sat up in her bed. And she said, preach. I'm so glad you're here. And I had to go. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And she was just oh, at yeah. death's door when I left the day before. But you see, the outward man... Woo! It's starting to fade. Yeah. And the inward man. Yeah. You see, when the outward man is run the last mile of the way, the inward man's just lacing up his, his track shoes. Amen. And I got to hear the inward man speak. Amen. She said, Preacher, look out that window right there. Yeah. Look what they done for me. Breakable nursing home. <laughs> That's where it was. And I walked over there just like a good preacher should. And I looked at that window and I seen a parking lot, just black asphalt, cars sitting everywhere. I didn't know what she was seeing, but I wasn't standing where she was standing. 
Yeah. You right. see what I'm saying? Amen. And I said, what do you think about that, Miss Wright? She said, why would they plant such a beautiful garden for me? I'm getting ready to leave, preacher. Yeah. Said, look at them lilies. Ain't them the prettiest lilies you've ever seen? You say it's a medication. Oh, you go right ahead and think what you want to. When the outward man gets near the grave, whoo! The eyesight of the inward man gets a little brighter. The hearing of the inward man gets a little more. Oh, man, I've sensed it so many times. My, my. So don't look for a rose garden here in the flesh. You know, I, I think about this, and we've been forewarned. In this world you shall have tribulation. He told us that. And I, this one gets me all the time. Most time I could quote these, but your memory just sell on, man. I don't want to misquote scripture. So I wrote this one down. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Yet when a fiery trial comes, even though we've been pre-warned, we act like some strange thing has happened to us. Isn't that something? When we've been forewarned. It's not about the box. Yeah, the hinges is broke. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it's fault. You know, when my daddy died in 1988, he left me his tools. And he had a right angle drill and a Milwaukee Sawzall probably, I don't know, 40, 50 years old. And the box was falling apart. If you looked at the box and, and you said, do you want to you buy this, uh, this right angle drill? And somebody looked at the box and said, yeah, well, I don't, I don't know. I think I'll pass. But when you opened it up, them tools still look brand new. <laughs> yeah. Still look brand new. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know you get old, you start falling apart on the outside. Amen. But there's something inside you that has a yearning and a longing. All this garbage that's going on. I got a granddaughter. I got a granddaughter. Man, I drill Haley all the time. Man, I do. I mean, I just sat down and talked straight to her about all this garbage. She's told me all the garbage that she had to deal with it at Clinton High School. And, Papa, you won't believe this one. And, you know, and I hate that. It makes me sick to my stomach. I mean, if there was ever a time that God's people need to get on their face and pray, it's now. But I'm going to I've got to be honest. I have to be honest, especially behind this pulpit. When I see all of this stuff going on, there's something down inside me starts jumping up and down. I, I can't help it. Why, preacher? Because the old inward man is on his way out. Amen. We're about to leave this graveyard in the sky. I'm telling you. We're about out of here. It's just about over. My outward man's going to suffer. Bank on it. He's not going to stop life just because we're saved. Well, I can't believe he'd let this happen to me. He's no respecter of persons. It rains on the just and the unjust. Well, that's in Matthew chapter 5. That's Jewish. There's a spiritual application. It rains on the just and the unjust. My, my, my. There's a promise, though. <laughs> Man, if we could just get our eyes off of the temporal. When our troubles come, if we just stop thinking in temporal terms Amen. and start thinking in eternal terms. I'm going through this for a reason. I know he's not forsaken me. Let me show you what the Lord does. I'm, I'm coming to a close. I'm coming to a close. Somebody asked my son, what does that mean? Mark said, nothing. I was trying to help a church out that was without a pastor for some time. They got so low, they only had one service a week. They'd meet 11 o'clock Sunday morning, no Sunday night, no Wednesday night. And so my granny was in Breakable Nursing Home, uh, Beverly Park Place, I'm sorry, Beverly Park Place. Mammy was 99 years old when she died. She liked three months making it to 100. And I'd go over since they didn't have a Sunday school and I'd, I'd, I'd go get her, and I'd push her wheelchair back to where the services was. And I'd stay with her as long as I could, watch my watch, and then I'd have to leave to make it to church, and somebody else would push her back to her room. And when I'd go in, uh, walking in, there was always, on Sundays, uh, two black gentlemen that sat out there, 
in wheelchairs uh, right when you walk in. And one of them was a preacher, always had his Bible on his lap. And they sat there waiting for the church bus to come and get them. And I'd, I'd walk in and say, hey, good morning, preacher. I'd say, hey, you boys doing? Oh, we're doing good. We're doing just, we're just doing good, waiting on that church bus. You ready to go to meeting, preacher? I walked in there one Sunday, feeling almost like my brother did, that I'd went to see a long time ago. Things going on didn't make any sense. I even questioned the Lord. You said all things work together for the good. How in the world can this work out to be any good at all? Yeah. <sighs> I was walking in there. There they was. I wish you could. If you seen them, if you seen them, brother, you'd say, bless their hearts. Oh, bless their hearts. Nobody comes to see them. They sat there every Sunday waiting for that church bus. Both of them in a wheelchair. One of them so crippled, he can't, he can't even he can't raise up like the other. He's down like this. You know, when you talk to him, you, you feel like you got to, how you doing, brother? <laughs> because he can't straighten up. And for some reason, that Sunday, I walked in to push Mammy back to the services. And the preacher brother said, Preacher, the Lord wants us to sing you a song. Have you ever seen a black person that couldn't sing? Never, never. And I just stopped for a minute. And uh, I said, okay, brother. Lord wants you to hear this, preacher. I said, okay, I'm ready. You ought to heard him. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Yeah. yeah! Forsaken you think? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The treasure's on the inside. Amen. Forsaken as far as the world's concerned. But oh no. <laughs> There's a treasure inside that earthen vessel. Amen. That's the part of you he promised he would never forsake. Ever. Ever. <sighs> Ain't gonna happen. My, 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 my little sister that came to church here, people were shocked. They didn't even know me and Sharon was brother and sister because we never, we never talked in, in church. We just never, we, we just never, it's just me and Sharon. We just didn't talk in church. We loved each other. And I got that phone call. Sharon told me when she got sick, she said, the Lord is, uh, I just want to live long enough to raise them two boys and and then, uh, then I don't, I'm not afraid of death. I'm, I'm ready to go. And I just feel like the Lord has answered my prayer. He's going to let me live long enough to be able to see them boys raised. And I said, okay, honey. I said, as long as you've got peace about it. And it wasn't long after that that I got the phone call to come to the old St. Mary's up on the hill. And they said, all of her organs are shutting down. I said, she's not going to leave the hospital. And I ran up there. I went into the ER. And there's my little baby sister, man. Yeah. Yeah. And I went over there and I rubbed her hand, patted her on the face. They had that oxygen mask on her in the ER, and the sound was muffled. It was muffled, and Sharon was just rocking her head back and forth, saying, Oh, Jesus, help me. Oh, Jesus, help me. Oh, Jesus, help me. You heard that, brother? Oh, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Yeah. I'm human. I sat there for a minute, but my heart broke. Yeah. And I said, okay. Sure. Lord, what's the problem here? I don't want to have no trouble hearing her. Can't you hear her? I'm, I don't have no problem hearing her, and she belongs to you. They finally came and said, there's nothing we can do for her. So we can take her back to her room, keep her comfortable. Family can stay with her until she passes. They put her back in a room, took all the needles out, pulled everything out of her, went over and kissed her on the cheek. I rubbed her hand. I cried and I sat down. The last thing I had seen was that oxygen mask over her face. Yeah. Saying, Lord Jesus, help me. Help me, Jesus. 
you know, I've come to Temple so many times and left to go pastor. Okay, but, man, I, I came here when Temple was the little bitty building up here. Yeah, I held Pammy when she was just a little baby. And I'll leave and go preach and go pastor, but he's always been my pastor. Always. And every time something bad has happened in my family, he's always been there. Some of them, I don't even know how he found out. He's always been there. We were sitting there. Preacher Lawson sitting right beside me when my sister was dying. We both heard the same thing. All the needles are gone. All the needles. The outward man has hollered all it can holler. Okay. Yeah. It's just about gone. And just before she passed. Whew, you remember that, brother? And two little arms went up in the air. And the preacher said, look at her, brother. She's reaching for something. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. What's that, preacher? He come for the treasure. Bless your heart. Yeah. It's not about the earthen vessel. No. It's about the treasure inside. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. My, my, my. Oh, I needed that. I needed that. Little arms went up. Preacher said, she's reaching for somebody. And I said, oh, yeah, she's reaching for somebody. Yeah. yeah. I know who it was. It was a shepherd saying, Sharon, I'm right here, sweetheart. <laughs> I never left you. I never left you. Wasn't long after that, her arms went down. And she graduated. Amen. But the inward man didn't speak to the outward man was almost dissolved and gone. Amen. Wow. Man, the older I get, the hungrier the inner man becomes. I've had almost 70 years of this world. My, there's nothing there. But there's something that feeds and excites this inner man. My, my, my. You say, well, you don't know what I've been through. I don't know what you've been through. You don't know what I've been through. <laughs> you don't know. When you look at your brother or sister, most of the time all we think is what we're going through. Uh-huh. You ever stop to think about what they might possibly be going through? Yeah, right. My, my, my. But as far as being forsaken, let me show you something you can do. It works every time. I've got this. I've got a picture in my study. I've got a picture in my study of a young lady, Kimmy is, I still call her Kimmy, she's 51 now. She wrote me this, she writes me these all the time. She wrote me this when she was 47. This stays right in my study. And I get to feeling like, okay, Lord, you know, had this meeting canceled because of that, and this meeting canceled because of that, and, and nobody likes me anymore to stuff it. It's just like, Lord, you know, why don't, I don't understand. You know, you, you get under a juniper tree, and you whine, and you squall. Kim Miller's got cerebral palsy. I was her pastor for five years. I'll tell you this, and then we'll do an invitation. I was her pastor for five years. Kim has always been confined to a wheelchair. Her mind is very sharp. She can't talk. She can make sounds. She can't talk. She can send text. <laughs> can she send text? <laughs> because she would wear me out. She wanted to know where I was preaching what time I was preaching, because she'd be praying for me. She always would pray for me. And, and, and you know, I'd get busy, and, and, and two or three of the emails, uh, uh, they'd get lost and shuffled, and she sent me one, one, one day, and all they said is, are you dead? <laughs> and, but Kim came to, uh, I, I, I preached Heather, her, her little sister. Heather was born in a wheelchair, never took a walk. Heather couldn't communicate at all, at nothing. She, all she could do was smile. Kim had a big old book. She had her a big old book, had words in it. And she'd point to them words. That's how she'd talk to you. And, but Kim had, uh, when, the, when the spirit, you know how it was in here this morning, people came and started praying. And if you know the Lord, you sensed that. You sensed it. If you know the Lord, nobody had to sit down beside you and say, hey, dude, something's going on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know that. Yes. Now your outer man could care less. Right. Outer man, what time did that ball game start? When are they going? But that inner man sensed that. Yeah. And I'd be preaching down there in Harriman, 
to a bunch of dry hide, just <sighs> watch watchers. When's he going to get through? And boy, when the Holy One would move in, Kimmy would be in her wheelchair about halfway down this aisle. And when the presence of the Holy One would move in, Kimmy would, ooh, ooh. man, she could sense it, boy. I mean, she could sense the presence of the Holy One. And I'd just, I'd get out there, that's right, Kimmy. He's here, honey. He's here. Me and you will welcome him. And man, her little arms would go up, couldn't say a word. She'd just, ooh, ooh. her daddy told me about the night she got saved. She had her book. Brother Junior said that Kim was in there with Heather, sitting wheelchair to wheelchair. And, and they, was, they could understand each other. Now go figure that one. I know, they knew, they, them two sisters could understand each other. Yet Heather couldn't talk. Junior said they was in there squalling and going on and making a racket. And he said, I went in there and I said, what's going on, girls? Kimmy had her little book out. And she pointed to, get saved. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Junior Miller had the opportunity to get on his knees and lead both his little girls to the Lord. Now, if you've seen Kim, oh my goodness, if you've seen her, you go, oh, bless her little heart. Oh, God love that young, and she's 51 now. Went down there about three weeks ago and surprised her, and I walked in. <laughs> As soon as I walked in, and she can say, sing, sing. I said, Kimmy, you don't want me to sing. Sing, sing. My boat of life sails on a troubled sea. Whenever there's a wind in my sail. And Kimmy just ah, 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 sung one verse, and she said, yeah, yeah. And I said, what's she saying? Her mama said, she's saying, is that all? And that's Kimmy. I'm about to come to a close. I'm talking about those that feel forsaken because of what's going on to the outer man, okay? Not about him. It's about the treasure inside. He can't forsake that. Kimmy sent me this. Thoughts for the day. My life hasn't been easy having cerebral palsy. I'm 47. I've always had to depend on people to do everything, mostly mom and dad when he was still living. Now mom is trying to take care of me. I know it's hard, but we take it one day at a time with God's help and with some very special people. I don't know what we do without these very special angels that helps us. Sometimes we don't have as much help as we need, but we make it with God's help. Her mama's 82. This is not the life that I want, but it's the... But it's the life God wants me to have. And if he's happy, then I can't complain. He makes no mistakes. So there's a reason I have cerebral palsy. Now I can't say that I haven't asked why my life is this way. But most of the time I'm happy. But I'll walk one day on streets of gold. <laughs> But until then, I'm here, and I'm not going to give up, and I'm going to live my best life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And she said, Brother Barry, I love that old song, until then. <laughs> uh, you say, my goodness, man, that poor little old thing, she saved, but I mean, all these years, 51 years now, the Lord's left her in that condition my, I thought he said he'd never leave you, never forsake you. Oh, you wouldn't have to be around Kim very long to realize she's not forsaken. She's not forsaken. I'll tell you this, and then Brother Van, go ahead and get one ready. I, I was doing, a, I was doing, keep in mind, keep in mind, keep in mind, the hole's battered, I know it is. The cells are torn, I, I know that. But thank God the anchor holds. I was doing a wedding down at the church, and it was one of Kim's friends. And Kim's never drove a car, never been on a date. Can't go very far at all without somebody's help. And Kimmy was all dressed up. She'd always sit in the vestibule back there. 
she sat in the back in a wheelchair, and then when the service was over, they'd open the two doors, and they'd push Kim out there. And I, there, I wasn't going to get out of the church without talking to her. It's, it's not going to happen. And she'd wait on me, and I'd be tired, wringing wet with sweat. And I'd say, what do you want? You're driving me crazy. You'd have to know the relationship me and Kimmy had. She'd open her little book. She would do this. If she'd look, and if Shannon wasn't around, she'd point to handsome. <laughs> and I'd say, Kim, quit that. You stop that. And she'd just, ah. But she'd point to done, flip over a couple of pages. Good. I'd say, thank you, Kimmy. I'd done that wedding. And you know, brother, some weddings are spiritual. And some of them like a funeral, man, you know. Uh, you know, especially if they got to stand here, stand there. No, don't stand here. No, don't step on that. Oh, man, just, uh, just give me a Bible and let me marry these two people. You, you go play in a traffic or do something. This was a very spiritual wedding. It was one of Kimmy's friends. And boy, she, oh, she was. She was a gorgeous bride, man. I mean, long, beautiful white dress and a train and all of that. Just gorgeous, man. And I married those two. And I look, I didn't look at Kim. I knew better because I had to keep my mind on what I was doing. And I didn't look at Kimmy until after I pronounced them man and wife and told them that the reception was in the fellowship hall. And I released everybody to go. And of course, they played the music and she went walking down with that long train. When everybody was out of the building, everybody was gone. <laughs> it's just me and Kimmy. And I thought, Kimmy, why don't you just go on over there, you know? And I walked back there, and big old tears had been running down her face. And I'm thinking, she's thinking, I'll never have a husband. I never have a wedding like that. That's what I'm thinking. I'm, I'm thinking she's feeling so forsaken. Oh, why couldn't it be me? She got her little book. She opened it up. Man, she knew more Bible than most preachers I've listened to. She studied her Bible, man. And she pointed to two words. Two words in her book. You know what it said? One day. I said, you're right, Kimmy. One day you'll be a bride, sweetheart. One day your day's coming. It's coming. You say, well, forsaken, for cast down. Not forsaken. No. 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 Hull's going to get bent, battered, sails torn. But there's something inside you you're, that if you're saved that he cannot and will never forsake. Put him to the test. Get by yourself and tune the world out and the outer man out and get rid of all of it. Close your eyes and start seeking God and just, just close your eyes in the darkness and say, Oh, me, sing grace. Oh, wow. And that inner man starts to perk up. And that inner man says, Yeah, I ain't forsaken. Yeah, that carcass you're stuck in looks forsaken. Man, I ain't. I'm getting renewed day by day. Imagine what it's going to be when the trump sounds. Lord, thank you for using me. Thank you for liberty, Lord, to be able to preach and share my heart tonight. Thank you for the folks that's here. Somebody needed this, Lord. I know somebody needed it. I don't know what people's going through. They don't know what I'm going through. We don't need to know. We just need to pray for each other. We're getting so near the end, my Father. God, please help us to not allow anybody to lag behind. Pick our brother up. Come on. Uh, come on. Just start. I'm going to drag you to the finish line, man. We're too close now. We're just too close. I pray tonight, Lord, in the invitation that you'd speak to the inner man. Speak to the treasure inside. I ask you to do it in Jesus' sweet, blessed name. Amen. Amen. Amen.